I want to talk to you about Curveball, right? Is you spent twice over the last, what, eight months, a few days in Africa on mission trips. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to talk to you. You did one post about some of the farming over there right. and some of the food insecurities over there. And I, I just wanted to pick your brain about this is happening in 2023. There's places that have food insecurity. There's places that are farming almost primitively or right. you know, they don't have the, the resources that you do. So I just want to get your take on what you saw. Where were you? Yeah. What you were doing, all that kind of stuff. I deeply admired it, of course, because I'm going there, one, for a different purpose. But at the same time, I'm very agricultural minded. And so, you know, everybody else is looking at, you know, lifestyles and various things that they're looking at. And I'm admiring all of the small farmers. Like everybody there is a farmer. Uh, last August. Where, where is this? <clears throat> yeah. So last August we were in Tanzania. It's in the upper region, Mara region around Lake Victoria. It's a kind of a, one of the, I think it's the second or third biggest freshwater lake, massive lake. And uh, so we were on. They got um, bass in it. <laughs> well, a lot of tilapia because that's all we ate. My son was, he, he first got there, was his first trip, uh, mission trip. And so we went there and like every uh, dinner was a fish head and rice. And so he still, I don't think he still had rice <laughs> eight months later. But um, so I'm really admiring this stuff. And, and I'm asking our translators and just really getting into it because everybody is a farmer of sorts they've got um and they and they're starting to teach these you know the the other missionaries that are there and just people that have kind of started pouring into um these communities just great people i mean awesome hearts and and uh the the folks in tanzania are just awesome such a peaceful um country you know this akuna matana which is from we always thought was from lion king i thought that was like literally from that movie that's literally they're saying you know like life is great don't worry about it kind of thing so it's extremely peaceful but um, so I started chatting with them quite a bit about their agriculture and just observing. But they 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 very hard work and everything is done with manual tools. But like corn is their big thing. They have rainy season and then they have a dry season, basically. So they've got like eight months out of the year where it's six to eight months where it's just rainy. And um, and that's when they plant their rice. That's when they do their their corn. And um, and so but they all do it in small plots. They've got rice. They each probably have maybe maybe a 50 by 50 little thing for ri growing rice. And they'd have a same thing, sa similar size for like their corn. But then I started looking at some of the brassicas and I was asking, because they just call it greens. I don't even like, I'm like, is that collards or is that kale? But they would have their entire yard and they, their, their, their brassicas, I, th I think it was kale. It was a different variety. It was either kale or collards were three, four foot tall. Where are they getting their seeds from? I, I don't know. That's what I, will, I asked them too. I'm like, well, where do you get your seeds? How do you source this? Like, and I even started asking them like compost and what do you do? You know, like all of the things that we think of, you know, from uh, the micro farms, the stuff that we do. Yeah. And I'm like, have you ever heard of compost? They're like, no, what is that? And I'm like, and, and I'm like watching this guy um, maybe 30 yards away from me. He's just taking all of his his um greens and he's like burn them they're burning all their stuff and i'm like and i told my translator i'm like you should go tell him to like save because he's got a farm right you know in his backyard i'm like compost and the, and the translator's like i i don't know what that is like i can't i can't translate that like that doesn't make sense to me and so um but through that i've been constantly communicating still with them and, and teaching them how to you know these concepts of composting like take all these scraps all your weeds and all this and and so it's just it's been really interesting to be able to kind of take that knowledge and pour into them, you know, cause it's just, it's, it's, um, it's a different mindset, right? Of so what have you taken away? I like, what have, what have they taught you? Well, just the dedication, you know, and one, we've got it so easy here with all the tools we've got. I mean, when we, when we look out at a field, we see, you know, especially commercial or big ag, right? Big tractors going down. You, you see a big field down there. You'll see 20 people out there with an oversized hoe and they're, plowing that ground by hand you know just dedicated in and they're all community like they'll work together on this field they'll go to the next field you know to their neighbors and do the same thing and that that type of community i think we lack you know we, oh, we sure. get it we get it from here right from social you know social networking and just networking with other people but we're such high-paced people and quite selfish you know, like we just were so busy that we, we really don't have that time to afford that time. These people will sit in their backyards, hang out, have tea or whatever, and go help each other. And they just, they farm with each other. They help one another. And it's all about making sure everybody has food on their table. Now, is this 
family farms, feeding families? Are they taking it to market? Like what'd you see? A little bit of both. Um, but mostly that is their business. You know, they, like I said, they, they are starting to teach them some of these smaller communities. Hey, they'll give them a chicken. So like some of these fundraisers, like you go to, you know, compassion or national or some of these, um, world vision these these organizations they instill they'll they'll give a child a chicken and and have them learn how to raise that chicken and to sell it and then they'll give them another chicken and so they keep teaching them you know economics of this and uh, and so that it's been really interesting to see that kind of that that mindset go where they're starting to take this more of a commercial not just feeding us but also to be able to go sell to be able to buy other things and, uh, and so you saw, I mean, like I saw a little shepherd boy, it's eight years old, maybe 10. These kids, they, they run their cattle. They look like Texas longhorns, but they're really skinny, you know, chewy. We had a lot of some of the meat there and it was pretty chewy, but nonetheless, these little shepherd boys, even with their goats are walking along the main roads, um, with, with their animals and they're just grazing them alongside, you know, the roads. And then they, you know, bring them back home during, at the end of the day. So they just sit out there all day with them, let them graze in the ditches and then they'll hmm. usher them back home. So it just, you know, it, I, I think it's probably very similar to how, you know, probably America was in the early days, you know, is it bartering? Is that like, like what's the economics of it? Like what's the trade there? There's some bartering, but a lot of it was at markets. I mean, very similar to like our farmer's market, just, um, not necessarily in, uh, as, as a clean, like you go there and you'll see piles of like little minnows, what we would call, you know, what they're selling. So that the aromatics, right. It's not as pleasant of an experience, but for me, I was extremely motivated. I mean, they've got cages and cages of chickens, you know, stacked up for people to buy. And you seriously, when they leave the market, they'll have, you know, five or six chickens in each hand they're walking through and you don't know if they're carrying dead chickens or live chickens, but you know, after you realize they were live chickens, they were just buying from the What's the population like uh, where you're like this, this town mm -hmm. that you're in or village that you're in? What was the, how many? Um, so the main, the, the, the main place, I shouldn't say the main place, but the, the hub that we went to was Mwanza in Tanzania. And that was like 2 million people. We, from there, um, we, we saw one, one market there, but we went up to, um, Bunda, which is in the Mara region of Tanzania. And that's probably, um, a hundred thousand people, but you're talking now spread out in, in, you know, across thousands of miles, or at least I should say maybe thousands of acres. And so, you know, hundreds of thousands, maybe, you know, uh, but they're small villages. This is like, there's one well for, you know, a hundred villages, you know, type of sense. Well, speaking of that, like, how are we irrigating? That's, that's the other thing I asked them. So this last trip, I went just um, a couple of weeks ago, they were in Zambia and, and, I asked them, like, because they've got all these roof structures, and the guy says he, he every, so they operate a school there for like 500 kids, and they oper, um seven times a day, they have these guys wheel 55 gallon drums of water about a mile and a half away, and they roll them down the road to to do that, and they've got all their structures, you know, and I'm like, well, you know, why don't we harvest, you know, why don't we you harvest this water coming off your roofs? And he says, well, we just don't know what to do, you know, how, how to do that, to care for it, you know? And, and, um, I think they, they conceptually get the fact that you can collect the water, but it's the long-term retention. Like it sits in the heat of the day. Well, it's not like, it, I mean, is that, that's what you said earlier. We have the tools, we have the access. Yeah. I can't imagine there's like a whole ton of roto molded big barrels that you would need to yeah. do this. Yeah. And so I think it's just they a lot of, and they're really eager to learn. Like they, I mean, every time you're there, they're just like so eager to understand. And to well, that's a worry. You don't want to go over there and tell them how to do right. how they fed your, their family for generations. Right. It's I mean, that's tricky, too. And like giving unsolicited if I like run a podcast here. But the fact that we have to give unsolicited advice all the time is a tricky situation because you mm -hmm. don't want to tell people how to run their yeah. business. Let's talk about some ideas. And I, I think that's it because you were asking your translator. You guys working it out. Mm -hmm. Seems to be a little bit could have been better received. You right. know what I mean? Well, and some of that's just cultural. Like you, like they, and we get stuck in that same thing. Well, why are you doing this way? Well, it's cause that's what our ancestors, ancestors did, you know, and there's a lot of that mentality. It's and very smart people that are just scared of changing because they don't have the resources to be able to, you know, m to invest and to go do something, not knowing what the outcome is like, 
oh, water harvest sounds great. How well, am I going to go out and do this? Well, if they invested something new and they missed the opportunity to, I mean, that's a big hit. Right. Did you get any sense of like what the the harvest slash storage and transport aspect of the whole thing was? No, and again, most of that, what I admired. Let me let me answer that in a long winded way. One is it's all local, like what what we as Americans always strive for and promote, at least in this space, this industry. We're always like, buy local. Well, over there it is local. And I've been telling a few people like, in, when, when the global economy fails, places like Africa are gonna thrive because they don't, at least in the, in the villages, not necessarily in the, the big capitals and the cities there, everything is all local. Meaning you harvest and you go to the market. And very similar to what we do, you know, the, but there are no stores. Like you go to the market and you buy and you Market's sell. Market's always on. It's always on. Every day it's open. That's where you go and you sell your produce at. They don't have their dependency on this huge supply chain. The supply chain is are the local farmers. And where we were, it was the fish farmers. It was, um, you know, the, the, the corn. It was everything. All of the produce and, it, I mean, beans little whatever these little fish were you know i mean so were the producers specializing like the the corn farmer was he or she specializing in that or was there any mixed gardens there were some mixed but by and large like corn is like their staple i would say i, I would say the two main three three main crops that i saw there was a lot of other things but was cassava which ever since i've been back from africa i see cassava everywhere it's like this starch uh, we would call it like a potato, but it, they use the roots. Well, they use all parts of it, but the roots are the main thing. And it's in the Philippines. It's in the, I mean, it's, it's throughout the world. Apparently, we just don't grow it here. But if you look in your ingredients, it's in a lot of things that we eat. Uh, but it's a it's Which a means it's coming from somewhere. Right, yeah, and it's typically overseas. Um, but cassava was a big, was a big um, crop. Uh, corn, and then... Uh, the greens, what they call That's what I was saying. I don't know if it was kale or collards. They just called it a green. Could have been something totally different. It, right. It might have been. Um, it very. It had a very similar taste and flavor, to because we ate it every day, to uh, like a collard or a kale. Other than food goods, uh, was there any, like, hard commodities or soft goods at the market, like clothes, fabric, stuff like that? Yep. A lot of, a lot of um, uh, what do you call it, artesian type stuff, like... Uh, the women would bring baskets. They would weave them, um, even apparel. Um, uh, I mean, you name it. I mean, they're they're opportunists as well, right? If they if they all of a sudden, you know, like you'd find some place that like at a market stand, it would just be full of used shoes. You know, I don't know where the used shoes came from, but like that was what they were selling at the market. Um, but mostly it was produce. Lots of. Jets 2023 Super Bowl champs. <laughs> you did see a lot of that. Dang, like, man. That was really interesting. Like, I saw uh, Lakeville, which I don't know. There's probably lots of Lakevilles. But when I saw Sorry, this, Brad. it reminded me of my, you know, my my childhood. We always played against uh, Lakeville, you know. And, and uh, so I saw clearly that is a, you know, a lot of their clothes were from probably our Goodwills. Right. You know, so they were all wearing American, you know, hand-me-down American clothes. Um, and so you'd see a lot of that at the marketplace, a lot of, you know, spinoffs of, jerseys and things you know that were clearly not authentic brand new nfl branded you know stuff but for the most part it was all necessities was the was there like a street food situation like could you get something to eat while you're there at the market um there was a little bit of that but we didn't adventure into that just because you know your our guts aren't <laughs> you, you don't know how it's pretty you know we i don't know how we well, looked like hell when he came back so <laughs> yeah. there's that yeah yeah this last time for specifically yeah um i i do and so uh, we just came from zambia this last time and uh, i was we were in the main city there was this lusaka and we had like a six hour delay before our flight. And so we were sitting, we, they dropped us off at a mall to wait cause they had to go run the bit, their schooling and everything. And, and there was a, what I thought was a finer restaurant there and they had sushi <laughs> and, and I order it. And then I ordered a salad with it, it had salmon on it and it comes out and the lettuce is completely soaked, you know, with water. And I'm looking at the sushi and all of a sudden I realize 
this is probably not a good idea. Like, I'm going to be trapped on an airplane for 24 hours after this. Jeez, <laughs> but dude. I just ordered all this food. But anyways, I did it. And uh, against my better judgment, fortunately, no no uh, repercussions from that. But I was extremely scared for the next 24 hours on that on that flight. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, but yeah. But yeah, it's been, it's just been, it's been really eye-opening, you know, being in, in third worlds, if you will. Um, utterly amazed at the hard work that still goes on. I mean, I've got images of these tribal women walking away with just, I mean, these ladies are like 80 years old and they're carrying 50, 60 pounds of corn on their head. I mean, like beyond anything that any one of us could do. I was just utterly amazed at that and uh, just proud, you know, to be able to go down there and, and uh, help help whatever we can. And I, I hope at some point that we can um, marry some of the experience and the, the practices that we do here in, in this micro farming to there. So um, is there could there be like a a dedicated trip just for that? I That's what I've been working with. So the organization that we go through is Hope, Hope is Strong. It's something that we uh, helped uh, start a few years ago. Um, Hope is Strong. I think it's Hope is Strong dot org is the website or Hope is Strong dot com might be. But Anyways, it's, it's really focused on just feeding the kids and uh, helping the widows over there. And um, my first time over there, I, I'm really thinking I'm going there just to observe and to re- figure out how I can kind of bring some of those practices over there. And in this last trip I was there, they were talking about opening up an orphanage uh, through this organization and having an area of, of farming. And my eyes just lit up like I've just like I realized. And earlier I was telling you about how you can take multiple areas of occupation and when you marry them together you create like a new desire a new niche or you know fulfill a need and I totally see that happening you know to be able to go over there and like to teach these people some of these practices like low till no till um, or just water harvesting all of these things and so it's very much a passion now of mine because I, I have got a desire to do that to help teach them to do that so it's 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 uh, something that is germinating I guess pun intended there to you know. And we do, I mean, we, it's not uncommon for us to get inquiries and also to ship. I'd say once every couple of weeks, we're, we are sending a package to Africa somewhere. Yeah. And Tanzania does seem to come up more often than not. Yeah, so, and so I started thinking about that. On. Like, how would, how would they literally, uh, you know, logistically get some of this stuff? Like, protected culture uh, and just some of the, the products that we have available. And I think they'd have to improvise at the same time. I think I think the opportunity is is so prime there. It just has to be affordable somehow, you know, to be able to get these tools in their and, hands and shippable. Right. And man, that that's yeah. that's the thing about shipping anything is there's not it's just not getting the product right. It, it's there's so much more involved. That last mile of it. Look, if somebody orders in Cincinnati, Ohio, us getting out to the last mile there is the, is the hardest yeah. part of the whole thing because that's the thing we don't have any control over mm-hmm. is who's delivering that package right yeah I, and I, that's it's a it's a huge hurdle you know I, especially in these third worlds and in, in the the smaller regions like how do they one because the dollar for example is 20 like 2300 shillings you know so it's like you can't ship an American product, one, the price of the American product versus, and then shipping, right? you know, and translating that all down to a well, one and, to 2,300. And what we are concerned with a lot of times is, okay, let, let's say somebody or an organization does come up with the money to, to buy this and we ship it. And again, all, <laughs> I think about all the hands that have to touch that box between us yeah. and them. And it's a lot and it's in seas and it's in ports and it's in that last truck and who knows what. And if something happens in that package right. and we have to replace it, yes, I mean, we're not making yeah. anything. And they're having to wait. They're going to miss their season. Mm-hmm. It's bad on both. Right. Yeah. Always something, It's man. a dilemma. Yep. And that's the thing. It's it's so easy to go, well, we can just do this and we can just do that. And, and a lot of – I feel like a lot of times when somebody's wanting to do some good that you have to have an idea of the whole picture. And sometimes this is down to the individual instance of what we're doing. It could be off season for us, or it could be in full season opposite of their season. And it just may not wind up or Mm -hmm. line up. And then there's compatibility issues. We're selling stuff based off Imperial measurements, sending 
things out that's dealing with metric. I don't know if it's going to fit or not. Yeah. Or I, well, I don't know what's available to them to buy local. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a challenge. I could, but I honestly, my m- when I was there, I seriously saw a million bootstrap farmer hoop houses <laughs> everywhere. Like I could just, it, it it'd be so great, you know, to yeah. be able to offer. But the practicality of it, you know, a lot of logistics involved. You're looking you know? at somebody that could buy a container load at a time, yeah, divvy it out, distribute it, distribute it correctly. And I would never say how to do that, you right. know. It's, yeah, I like to say it's not my town. It's, that's by far not my town. Right. Yeah. Definitely a need, but it's going to be a while. But all in all, very impressed with, like, how they're maturing. You know, like I said, I, I think it, this is going to sound horrible, but I just feel like they're 100 years behind us, you know, what we call in first world countries. But they're, I mean, everything that they're doing, though, like, you can tell, like, they're they're tracking. They're just behind. And so it gives me hope to realize, like, that the food crisis and all these things are, are going to be mitigated every year more and more. Is it a lack of like, um, I mean, I can't, there's obviously not a laptop in every house. Is it, how's the internet over there? Do they have internet bars? Is it, do they have access to information? They have, it's really interesting. So everybody surprisingly has a smartphone. It's not like our iPhones and Androids, it's the cheaper end. And then you get a card, basically there's like these little kiosk booths at a farmer's market that might be like a little, or even just on the side of the road. And it says, uh, I can't remember the, the internet provider there, but there's a few of them. But these little red booths, basically, hand-painted, you know, <laughs> most Americans wouldn't even dare walk up to one of these things. But that's where you go get your internet from. Even at, like the hotel we would go to, they would have to recharge because all these Americans came in there and they were taking pictures. Well, we, you know, they, they fill up their internet card they, and everybody takes pictures during the day and they go back to the hotel and the Wi-Fi and we drain it all because everything's uploaded to the cloud. And they're like, <laughs> they're like, we're out of internet access. So, <laughs> so they're buying, they're buying prepaid, so much data. Yeah. yeah. So it's prepaid stuff, but everybody does have a smartphone. I mean, everybody wants to take selfies with, with an American. They, they call us, um, Mzungu. So I guess that's, that's the same thing in, um, in uh, Zambia and in Tanzania, probably other areas too. But uh, so that's basically the name for an American or a, actually I think it's a white person is what Mzungu stands for. <laughs> but yeah, so a lot of, a lot of uh, selfies and they have the technologies and they're, they're, they're into all of that in a more healthy state than I would say than, you know, America is. Sure. So meaning they use the technology, not necessarily just for all social networking, but it's there for them. It's limited. So that prevents them from, you know, like they, I wonder, are we tracking weather? Are we tracking weather patterns or what's coming up? Are we forecasting? They, I, I didn't see any of that. No, they're not using their phone for tools. In fact, I know this for sure because I was asking them that very same thing. Like, how do you, how do you, uh, you know, it was literally the weather, like, because they were talking about going into the rainy seasons. I'm like, well, do you have like an hour by hour? Because like for us, micro farmers, we're always on our phone. Like the first thing I wake up in the morning, like, check the weather what is my hourly forecast even though i knew what it was the night before something changed change. overnight so that but that's not they don't have that um demand or that on demand or that that type of um technology if you will you know like it's not for them to download an app is is you know let, they have to calculate the cost of downloading another 30 meg app you know on their data plan oh yeah so that's wild how different everything is. It, it really is. And I would encourage anybody and everybody. And, and I say that about traveling around the States, yeah. how different things can be from local markets, you know, affinities for different products mm-hmm. and what they're adverse against and how things get treated just, just within the States. And I can't imagine. Yeah, it, it really is interesting. In, in Guatemala, too, we went once and it was just fascinating, you know, how how they live and their their world is you know based on they're very tropical it's all mangoes and bananas and you know it's just it's it's really the the perspective you get of farming it it helps you one realize what we've got you know like our problems as much as we gripe especially for the season we've had you know it's it's always something we're fighting but we're so far removed from a lot of the day-to-day stuff that most of the world still deals with 